start kicking things off whenever you're if you're ready. Uh, I've got a couple minutes worth of spiel to go through anyway. Yeah, let's get started, and then I think people could join in. Um, you can ask them to introduce themselves when they do. Sounds good. So, uh, hi, hi everybody. I'm Darren Johnson. I'm the uh, Buena Computer uh, Buena Ventura Computer Society uh, chapter vice chair. I'll give you a little housekeeping. Um, I will be monitoring the the Zoom chat window. Uh, so if you have a question, you you can uh, or some kind of code snippet you want to put in there, uh, you can type it in there. Um, as I think all of you or most of you have discovered, you also should be able to unmute. Um, so uh, Sanaz mentioned that this uh, you know she wants this to be interactive. So feel free to speak up if you have a question. Um, if it turns out you need to share your screen, there's a way for me to do that too, but there's an extra click or two I would have to do if, if that happens. Uh, this is part one of a three-part series, so part two will be a week from today. Uh, make sure you sign up. I'll be sending out a reminder to everybody who registered for uh, today's session. And I should be able to get a link out to the video as well. Um, that will probably go out tomorrow, but... Um, Certainly, the, the being an interactive participant, I think, is where, where you get the most out of this. Um, with that, I will go ahead and introduce tonight's uh, facilitator. So, Nasa Faraz uh, specializes in perception and sensor fusion to deliver actionable and nuanced information about the scene, whether it's weather, lanes on the highway, or heaps of garbage. Her most recent role was at uh, AMP Robotics, where she developed applications to automate the sortation of wasted or recyclable materials. Before that, she developed path estimation applications for advanced driver assistance systems at Aptiv. Her first job after earning her master's degree in aerospace engineering from uh, Pennsylvania State University was to develop avionics weather applications to detect storms, lightning, and wind shear at Collins Aerospace. She's currently tinkering with platforms to identify what would work best for the perception system she wants to build. She's an IEEE senior member and volunteered for quite some time uh, for IEEE Point of Ventura section. Welcome, Sana. Thank you, Darren. Uh, so that was me. Uh, I want to start with just a little bit, add a little bit more um, detail or, or color to, to what Darren said and talk about what motivated me to do this workshop and, and then invite uh, you all to introduce yourselves and, and um, let me know and let the rest of the audience know what got your interest and what you're looking for in this workshop today. So one of the things I've noticed is that getting to Hello World can often be the, the hardest thing, uh, whether it's a new programming language or a new environment, uh, just getting getting through the process of uh, compiling stuff, especially if you have dependencies, figuring out where they are uh, can, can be can have quite the learning curve. That seems like the most unpredictable part of the, the process of building code in all the, the, the experiences that I've had at least. And especially in over the course of time, I, I started programming more than 10 years ago and so much has changed. The, the Visual Studio IDE, the different IDEs that are available. Now you have things like generative AI giving you code recommendations and you've got DevOps come up and you've got so many different tools and and so excuse me sometimes it's hard to uh, find the signal in the noise and that's what I've been doing is 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 trying to identify the the tools that serve me best in taking an idea and, and putting it into code and getting it to run on a robot uh, so the focus for for this particular session will be just simply what what happens when you compile code and how can that process of compiling be, be automated and then as we develop the the next sessions it'll be more of a focus on DevOps and in terms of uh, how do we can put these codes into environments that can be deployed easily. And then uh, the, the third session will be more robotics oriented on how do we, given pieces of code that have been deployed for different platforms, how do you get them all to run together in the same um, compute environment? So in a nutshell, this, the, the motivation for me 
is to try and have my own sort of clean uh, starting point for building and developing code. Uh, because whenever I've gone to work, I've seen that they already have this pretty beefy infrastructure in place that you just add code on top of. And, and I, I want to try and see what the, the fundamentals of that are so that, that you can have a starting point. Uh, you and I, we can all have a starting point for our own projects. Um, so I'd love to hear from you if you want to, maybe I'll, I'll uh, to try and streamline the process, uh, start by, by calling out members in the audience um, and ask them what their uh, motivation, what their background is uh, with, with respect to programming, what their background is and, and what they're hoping to gain from, from this workshop and, and maybe future workshops as well. Uh, so start with Yurik. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yurik Zadruzhny, and I'm uh, from uh, Northrop Grumman here in Woodland Hills. Uh, at the moment, I'm in uh, Wood Ranch uh, at my home and uh, trying to uh, juggle between my work uh, laptop and uh, my uh, home computer. I've uh, got uh, Visual Studio installed on both uh, my uh, work computer and my home computer, and I just uh, took a an LLM slash AI class from Caltech and was totally fascinated with it. Uh, the uh, computer language that I learned uh, when I was in uh, university, USC, uh, was Fortran, of course, and uh, dabbled a little in uh, Visual Basic and uh, Ada. Uh, and, but I'm not a programmer by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, this uh, uh, Caltech class had some hands-on programming um, uh, using Copilot, and uh, it was really um, uh, fantastic. And I'm looking to uh, uh, be more comfortable uh, in this this environment and uh, use AI. Uh, I've got uh, ChatGPT and uh, Llama on my uh, home computer. I can't use it on my um, work computer. Uh, and I've taken several uh, DevSecOps um, uh, super streams from uh, Riley, O'Reilly, and uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm involved in several uh, IEEE uh, committees, and uh, one of them is uh, based in, in AI and education, and so I'm uh, uh, participating in that and uh, bringing my... Um, uh, my background to bear, I've been, uh, well, it must be uh, 50 years in the uh, uh, industry from air research uh, to uh, Lytton to Northrop Grumman. And that's me. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you, Eric. So I'm curious about uh, you know your your previous experience with C plus plus maybe, or what specifically are you hoping to learn from from this set of workshops? Uh, I'm looking to learn uh, Python, basically, but C++, definitely I'm uh, happy with C++. Uh, it's, it's workable. I work with MATLAB, and uh, I have uh, no problem uh, with that and simulation. Uh, so it's just expanding my environments and uh, horizons and uh, looking to go uh, virtual and uh, get as much information on uh, AI and uh doing things safely and um uh and uh with ethics sounds good yeah one of the focus in this workshop that i'm trying to begin is um infrastructure as code and trying to capture all the little details that we put into command prompts into configurations so i hope that that's that's something that you can take take in for other environments like python and, and ai as well definitely thank you very much for sure. Um, don't you, uh, tell me more about yourself and, and what brings you here. Hi, um, I'm a biomedical engineer by education and working for medical device company for 20 years. And I use MATLAB most of the time to process the data and collect and analyze data. <clears throat> and uh, the, the reason I'm interested in this workshop is this involves some uh, robotics because uh, I've teach robotics for kids and also I'm doing uh, some robotics for myself just for fun and make some small things like a 
uh, dog, dog, doggy door so using AI. They nice. recognize the dog and then open the door. That's so cool. Yeah. And, and then I'm working on other uh, small robot to bring my trash can to the gate from my garage door. Nice. So, yeah, so I wonder if, if I can yeah, get some idea about some platform that is useful for my future robot development. So that's the awesome. motivation. And, and so what's your comfort level with C++ and Visual Studio? It sounds like you're, you're already using a lot of that. I'm, I'm using most of the time. So far, I use MATLAB and uh -huh. I start to use the Python. I see. So, yeah, Python is pretty good and close to MATLAB. But yeah, C++, yeah. I used 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but yeah. don't, I didn't use C++ anymore. But if, if okay. it's really... <laughs> But that's recently I started using Visual Studio, which is a good uh, editor or yeah. for any any language. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, the focus will not be on C plus uh, plus. And I, in fact, on the last uh, session of the workshop, what we're gonna try and do is um, deploy some, uh, code in Python, C plus plus, and a mixed set of languages into one platform, um, because okay. that's typically what you see in a lot of robot robotics applications too. Okay. Good. Thank you, Dongchul. Sky, how about you? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Sana. I haven't programmed in about thirty years, and I want to uh, get started again with programming because I want to get more involved with the AI and uh, using it for projects. And also, I'd be very interested, of course, in learning to do the C++ Python linking together and going beyond the standard library in C++. So uh, also, the visual environments are would be new to me. We didn't have those back then. So I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, to quickly roll them out. And then maybe something to do with uh, code design. In other words, how to avoid making bugs in the first place to spend less time debugging. Is that something that might be covered? Uh, please, could you repeat yourself? How to spend less time making bugs? Is that what you said? Right. Yes, yes, yes. In other oh. words, uh, with good design, I think one can avoid make, making bugs. And therefore, uh, paradoxically, you might spend a little bit more time up front, but then save yourself a whole lot of time at the, at the end when you're desperately trying to find the bugs. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I would love to get your all your perspectives on this. My, I mean, I I created my fair share of bugs, and I expect them. And what I try to do is use the um, use ChatGPT to write the unit tests as well. <laughs> so use the GitHub. My workflow is usually to to write the code. Uh, with with the uh, chat, uh, GitHub Copilot, and then also ask GitHub to write unit tests for each of the the functions that I'm writing uh, to try and at least catch some of the bugs. But that, you, that's been my mo. So the AI tools like Copilot are you're finding them to be effective in in shortening the production time? I'm finding that. It takes about nine or 10 keystrokes to come up with generally code that I can modify and, and you know, use to my, instead of writing all of it myself, I could say generate a unit test and it does, but it doesn't do it right the first time around. Uh, but I still feel like asking it to generate the unit test 10 times until I get the right one takes less time than writing the unit test myself. Yes. So will you be showing us that type of uh, activity? Uh, I, will, I will not be getting into that necessarily because I think this the focus will be more on the platform development. But you'll see, I think, during the course of, if you're already comfortable with using the GitHub Copilot, then I think um, you should be able to, to get that up and running. But what I will point to is, where where unit tests can be defined and and maybe I can what I can do is include that in the next session is is um, identifying like the pro procedure for um, running and automating unit tests. Thank you. Yeah, sounds for sure. exciting. Sounds good. 
Yeah, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, Linda. Linda, are you there? If you're, the, if you're there, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? There yes, yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, um, no, no. I've actually been mostly doing uh, backend support. Um, and I've done some debugging, but I've never actually created anything. So that's mainly why I'm here. Nice. And, and can I ask, um, what, what are you, I, I guess, uh, from the perspective of, um, are you looking to get more hands-on with creating stuff or do you have any sp specific kind of things you'd like to, to get out of the workshops? Um, no, I just kind of general knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Um, sounds good. Darren, um, besides being very helpful and, and supporting this workshop as, as a co-pilot, uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your interests? Sure. Uh, so I um, was pleased to hear I wasn't the only one that uh, learned Fortran as their first language in college, uh, so, but um, I've written on quite a few programs in C, so I'm comfortable writing in C. Um, I have never done anything in C++. Um, I'm also reasonably comfortable in Python, though. Uh, for a few years before I left the workplace, I was actually supporting a uh, application that was written in Python. So um, I have not done anything with Docker, though, or any uh, any things things like that. So that, that's kind of something I'm really looking forward to with this nice. uh, this workshop. Right, we're gonna virtualize. Yeah. <laughs> so. So yeah, well, um, well let, before I dive into the introduction, uh, they, you know, appreciate everybody sharing their background and, and their motives for joining. And I also want to say that, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning from you all as well. Uh, so really would love feedback about, oh, hey, I tried this thing and it worked better or, or, or even clarifying questions. Um, the goal is for us all to, to walk away be feeling really comfortable with uh, not just what I described here, but also maybe sharing our own best practices and ways to improve on, on what I described. Uh, so let's get started. I've put uh, the link to the GitHub repository I prepared for this workshop uh, in chat. Please let me know if you can't access it. And, and while you do, I'm going to start describing, just generally speaking, the, the broad flow of, of C++ compiling. So, you know, I think, I, I think this might be familiar to a lot of you, but essentially what happens under, when we're working with Python, we don't really think about it as much because you type a line and then it gives you an output. But when you work with code that, uh, that gets compiled and built across a set of libraries, which most of the code that runs on real-time systems is usually uh, one of these compiled languages or, or gets built into an executable, even if you're, you're working with Python eventually, when you, when you put it into a device, it'll run an executable. Um, so between writing human-readable code and, and getting in an executable binary, there are a few steps that are involved. And the, the first is the preprocessor that, that processes all the hash statements that you see. This, this just kind of, uh, this is the step where it, it uh, pulls the right libraries, defines functions that are defined in the hash that are usually faster, um, and then it processes other hash statements. Uh, it produces something like hum human readable code and passes it to a compiler which then 
kind of builds a tree of, of all the things in the preprocessor uh, output and can, confirms whether it can be uh, these these instructions are reasonable. Do they follow the right format? Yeah. Uh, um, I, uh, in my transfer to the new computer, I lost the chat, so I, I don't see Oh, for sure. Uh, Here, link. let me put... paste the link again. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. I didn't realize that it's not persistent. So <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, for checking again. If, if I stayed on the same, the other computer, it would have been there. I'm sure. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I'm glad because I don't think the the folks who joined after I put the link in had it either. So, um, do you all have it now? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So. Not only that, but the GitHub link worked. I've got GitHub open now. You have a GitHub? Okay, you're all able to access it. If you if you can't, just uh, chime in and let me know, please. All right, cool. So when you go from the processor to the compiler, the compiler takes all the, the preprocessor um, outputs, and then it, it converts them into kind of like a set of instructions that are still kind of human readable. Um, they are more... Um, you know they're more elaborate than the initial short version that you yeah, that you provide because it translates all the different instructions and stretches them out into assembly language and then the assembler all kind of english slash math code and and converts it into binaries that are specific to the hardware that, that you're assembling on. And that's when it gets to these object files. Um, and typically it's depending on um, all, each of the sets of code has its own object files. And you might have object files from other libraries that you're using where you don't have all the information in written code. Again, like when you're sharing code with uh, customers or with, her, with other parties, you may not, provide the full human readable code, you might provide uh, libraries that are in this object um, format that are binary. And then the linker is what puts all of these libraries together uh, into one executable. And, and that's the, the thing that you would run in a um, as the end of your as the output of your software, but in a robotics application, you could have a variety of different executables too. So uh, this is the the process of going from one human readable file to one executable, and it's pretty standard. I think you know I'm not going to go into much detail here. But there's a bunch of resources. Uh, there's a great VS Code, uh, sorry, there's a great tutorial about the compilation process on YouTube by Mike Shah. And Mike Shah has great C++ um, videos as well. And then CppCon, I'll add it to the references, has a lot of great videos about C++ uh, and including one about the, the compile process. Um, so that's the, the general process that we're going to walk through. Uh, what we're going to do is compile code first using just the uh, terminal commands, and then we're going to set up so that we can use tools like CMake uh, to define all the compile parameters uh, so that when you, when you ship this code, it, it, there's no ambiguity about how it's compiled, um, and, and there's no ambiguity when you share it across the team about, about that process. Um, we will be using Catkin, not Qualcomm, so I'll, I'll change that just for the in the interest of simplicity, and then I'll explain when we get there um, about that. So far, uh, so good. Any questions so far about this? I'll take that as a no. Uh, the, the links okay, that are ahead. coming up in the process, uh, those in GitHub, uh, should we download one of those files uh, describing the process so that we can click on those links? Uh, do you mean these ones? Yes, exactly. Uh, so I think if you already have Visual Studio, you're good to go. Yes, I got Visual Studio and I just installed C++ uh, okay. onto Visual Studio. The, the okay. Module. So uh, what about the rest of you? Do you, is there anyone here who needs to download Visual Studio code?
uh, yes, I'll need to do that. Do I need to do that before uh, we finish this class or can yes. I do that after? Well, uh, so it's, it's, I'll leave it up to you. I recommend downloading it so that you can, uh, like I said, I, uh, this is a very interactive workshop and um, it would, it would be good to just kind of work through things together, but I, I don't, if you want to hang out and listen and, and do it later on your own time, that's totally okay too. I think I'll have to do that, but thank you for, for the help. Oh, for sure. Okay. So the first step is to download Visual Studio Code. Um, I have mine up and running here. And I'll talk about all the components that are in here uh, shortly. So let's see. Um, the, the next step, what I find helpful is, is to, to do the the coding in a Linux environment. Um, now, how many of you are using a Windows computer? How many are using Linux here? Any, any Linux users? Okay. Uh, so it looks like, Darren, you're using Linux. Uh, most of us are on Windows. And what I find for, for a lot of the robotics applications is that there's better support in Linux, even if you're not, even if you have the um, support in Windows, there's, uh, there's usually if you're working on a device in the field or something like that, they'll have, they'll be running a bare bones or a Linux uh, system. And so being comfortable in the Linux environment definitely helps. And in, if you're in Windows, uh, it, it's, uh, it's definitely like Eurek said, it's really good to have a Linux module. And this is the link here that, that tells you how to, how to install Linux in your, in your Windows. So um, if you want, you can, this is a good time if you're using Windows to open up PowerShell. Uh, so if you go here and you say PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, you can say w, WSL. I won't say install because I already have it, but well, I can, let me see what it says if I do. WSL install. And then what it does is it's, it's telling me that I already have Ubuntu installed. So if I look here on my, um, my file, uh, Browser. So now you're um, you're only sharing your. Uh, oh, wall. I see. Okay, let me share my full screen. Ah, uh, you share screen two. There we go. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So if I if I go to PowerShell and I say WSL install, if I don't have um, Linux, it'll it'll install it for me. And if if I do, it just tells me that I already have it, and I can confirm when I look here on my um, file browser, I can see that I have some some Linux virtual environments in here already. Um, so your sounds like you you have it installed, Dongchul. You have it installed. Uh, yes, I've just been into the PowerShell and I've gone through the WS install and it says I got Ubuntu. Nice. Awesome. So you want to go ahead and reboot and rejoin then? No. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. You don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to. Totally fair. Um, but... But yeah, the, this is why I, I like having um, the Nexus because it, it, it tends to, to have better support for robotics. Now, this is the crux of it. This is why we're here is to set up the workspace. Okay, so we were set up with Visual Studio Code. Uh, we're set up with Linux. What is, what even is a workspace? I keep hearing this. I don't know about you, but I keep hearing this term workspace and what I, the succinct definition that I've come up with is that a workspace is a folder that has a source folder inside it. So if you want to know where your workspace is, 
you can have a nested workspace, but to me, the, the bare bones definition of a workspace is that you have a source folder and in, in and any code that, that you define is inside of that source folder. Um, that's the minimum that any CMake or any other tool is going to expect for the definition of a workspace. Um, and then you can add, add to that. So first step, you create a folder and then you add a source folder to it. Uh, and then you create your, your code inside files within that source folder. Now in a, in a fully fleshed out workspace, you'll have not just a source folder, but folder, but you'll have a include folder in which your libraries will live. So within any, you know, this is just in this uh, workshop today, we won't be using any header files, but if you did have, have header files, um, you you define them inside this include folder. Uh, Eric, you talked about, we talked about unit tests. Unit tests would go into a test folder within your workspace. And then you have different um, different tools that will let you just define configurations for the header files, for linking header files in the C++ files, for running the unit test, all defined within this handy dandy CMake list, which we'll talk about towards the end of the, of the class. Any questions so far? All right, are we ready to write the hello world code now? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Sure. Uh, so <laughs> ask you all to create this hello world.cpp by typing touch hello world.cpp in your terminal. So you'll go in um, in here. And what I'm gonna do is- Excuse me. Yeah, so go ahead, Pancho. I, I missed the part to install the CPP. Oh, uh, that's right. Okay. Where is the part? Uh, I so C plus C plus plus. Um, you'd have to install the G, the the C plus plus compiler. And what I what I like to do. Uh, yeah, that is an oversight on my part. I just kind of assumed that that we would all have G++, but that is not the case. So in VS Code, this is how I like to do it, is, is in VS Code, uh, you can install the, the C++ extensions. Okay, so, so I can just install from extension. Yeah, okay. that's the best way. And, and you can also ex install it from command prompt. Uh, if you do G++, Usually Windows, I think, comes installed with it, but I could be wrong. And this is this is the pretty popular, the C++ extension pack, if you can see it. And what it contains okay. is a C++ compilers. It contains IntelliSense, which is essentially, um, you know, it's an autocomplete for C++. And what it does, IntelliSense is, I find, one of the, it's a precursor to your, your language models. What it does is it knows where all your, um, it's not using AI, it just uses, a, it uses the record of all your libraries to do autocomplete for functions and things like that. And, and that's key, I feel, for, for avoiding bugs and stuff is to use this IntelliSense because it just autocompletes based on the, the function definitions um, all of the different code that, that you're writing. So if you have libraries that you're using, IntelliSense helps you utilize those functions effectively. Um, so if you can download the C++ extension pack, you can also check, I think you can check G++. If you just type G++ and, and hello world, uh, you'll be able to see the, um, whether this compiles or not. And then what I find sometimes too with these things um, is that I'll, I'll try a command and if it's not, if it's jello world, if it doesn't exist, then, then the terminal usually, especially Linux will just tell me what to do. So that's really nice because it just, it just kind of tells me, um, you know, what I need to install. 
So it was the hello world in GitHub? Yeah. So I just got this out file and that's what happened when with G++ is I didn't really specify any of the other parameters. So it didn't give me an executable. It just created this .o file, uh, but it, it's a, a good check to just see if I, if I have it. Um, going back to the, the Linux environment, uh, one of the step three, one of the things I missed was if you do have the Linux environment, it's good to put your software in the home folder. Uh, so I usually have a software folder within my um, Linux Ubuntu home folder. And then that's where I put all my, my different um, software libraries as well as my own code. Um, because in, invariably a lot of things just kind of map to this pattern. Uh, so instead of having your code, well, one of the mistakes I did early on was to have my code in my documents folder, but that doesn't map neatly to the typical Ubuntu path, which is Ubuntu home user, and then within the user folder, you can add your software folder. Uh, because I didn't start my computer, so that's why I don't see that. Should I restart the computer? Yeah, go for it. If you if you yeah, want to, I'll, I'll yeah. be back. I'll be back. Sounds good. We'll see you in a sec. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about the rest of you guys? How are you doing? Well, I'm into Ubuntu. I see my uh, prompt, my username. Uh, uh, I've forgotten my password, but I'm sure I've got it somewhere in my computer. Oh, that was <laughs> that that I that was a painful experience because I did I. This is why I wrote down here in the readme to write down your username and password. Yes, I, I'm it, gonna have it, to look that up in the background. It's yeah. I hope you find it. Um, I didn't when I lost mine. And I found it really hard to reset it. I just couldn't reset it. So I ended up reinstalling the, the Ubuntu environment altogether. But anyway, uh, I think like this, this isn't super critical. If you wanted, you could probably use these, these commands in the Windows environment as well for the rest of this class. Some of this stuff might not work, but you should be able to, to follow along without it. Uh, but I hope you find it. Sky, Linda, any, uh, how are you, you two doing? Darren? Oh, I'm good. I, I already had uh, the compiler and uh, VS Code installed. Okay, cool. All right, so I think the next step is to uh, to run the um, the hello world code, and then this you know earlier I typed G plus plus source hello world, and it created this a very cryptic looking a dot out. And I'm gonna just for funsies see what what Visual Studio says. It's yeah, definitely a binary, not human readable at all um, and it's it's an object file. It's what, what the linker would link. So this command clearly just generates an object file for the C++ uh, code. So uh, while we wait for Dongchul, we'll talk a little bit about this code as well for, for those, those of us who aren't familiar with C++. Um, it's the structure of this code here is we include the IO stream library and uh, the IO stream library is a, a library that C++ has for in, for uh, spinning out, you know, the C out function. It, it helps you uh, write and read in and out from your command prompt. It helps you write and read to a file. Uh, so anything that involves writing and reading text is, is the purview of IO stream. So this is one of the most, most commonly used C++ libraries. Um, 
you'll see a lot of different times you'll see this these two carrots as your um, definition uh, the, what this means when you have a library inside of these two uh, brackets uh, triangle brackets it's usually that the the library is a stand is the standard library that you're using uh, whereas if you find if you find things like this this is where you're defining the library uh, yourself or you're using a third party um, the next statement here is to use use names Anna. yeah Sorry, because I log in again, I lost the link in the oh, chat. Oh, let me send you the yeah. link. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I can do it. Uh, okay, you. sounds good. Yeah. Um, so using namespace uh, STD essentially says that you're using the standard library. Now, this if I weren't using this, I'm going to comment it out. Uh, C out would show as not identified. This is because Cout is part of the standard library and is defined in IO stream. Uh, so because a lot of the C++ functions are defined in the standard library, uh, you can just say using namespace std. If you didn't want to do that, you could just say std colon colon, and then the, co the com compiler knows that, oh, okay, C out is coming from the STD library. But if you're using plenty of standard library functions, it's good practice to just say, I'm using this namespace right up front, and then you can use it without having to define that extra STD colon colon. Okay, so I'm in Visual Studio. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, do I pull in the GitHub file? Yes. So, uh, have you created your your folder, software folder? Uh, I'll show you what I've got. Sure. Okay, Sena. Yeah. So that okay. folder should be under Linux. Yes. Lin so, under Linux, and then so, Ubuntu. Yeah. If you go to, do you see this Ubuntu on yeah. your? Yeah. yeah. Go in there. And then go to home, home, user, your username. Okay. Uh, did you write down your username and password? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> and then, then create a software folder there. Software. Okay, got it. So now if your CD out here, out here, this, if you're in your software folder, this is where you'll say git pull the um the repository that i shared earlier okay so in in the visual studio how can i go to linux folder from my regular c drive um like cd and linux oh uh, uh, yeah that's a good question so if you go to file you say open folder uh, oh, okay um and then it'll okay. it'll show you where, where which one you can open so i see those driver but i don't see linux when i go to the open folder from uh this feature Let's studio see. okay uh when you are you in um let's see. yeah I, I see that uh, linux from just uh uh, Explorer, file manager, I can see it. Uh -huh. If if I go from uh, Visual Studio, maybe I should restart the Visual Studio now. Uh, no, I think it should be okay. Let's see, Yurik. Let's see if we can see it on your system and and reverse engineer it for uh, Dongshul as well. Sounds when, good. Okay, when you I'm... go to open folder. Okay, and in in, uh, in Visual Studio. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so file, open folder. Okay. Um, ooh, interesting. Uh, would you mind checking in that, under that organize? Um, yeah, if we can, if we can find it in, in there. Over there at the top. Is there a Linux, Ubuntu link up there? No. Interesting, because when I say open folder on my end, it, it brings up this, um, instead of bringing up Windows Explorer, 
it brings up the the address where so i can just say uh -huh. the address here but what you could do is try that in your address that address uh, bar uh -huh. and see if it if it gives you the the takes you to that ubuntu open folder yeah doesn't allow me to because it doesn't map to the c c drive right it maps to the ubuntu environment um and which is on linux so maybe try this wsl localhost okay i can just copy and paste okay now yeah. it works do you see it uh, uh Yurik, if you want, try this. Uh, uh, here, I'm going to paste it in chat. Okay, I've got the search for Ubuntu in my files. Can you see my directories here? Yeah, I I've can got see Ubuntu that. 22, see? is that it? Uh, that's probably it. Double click. Oh, that's just logs. See if you can... Um, Get the chat. Yeah, let's try that. And then also we, well, the other thing we can try is connect to. Sometimes that, that works too. Then it'll allow you to connect to WSL. So here, if I if I say connect to on that in Visual Studio environment, one of the options it gives me is connect to WSL. So that's under file. How uh, do you see this this little on the bottom um, left? Okay. Yes. No, if I don't see a, a a box there. This equivalent. Uh, or in the in the main uh, when you go into the main home, um, the, I saw this connect to option in that list of options on the front page. Uh, on file. Here, let me see if I can show you here. In this recent links, in, uh -huh. in the start, this one. Uh -huh. So if you say, uh, click connect to. Got it. Does it give you a connect to WSL option? Yes, it does. Try, try clicking on that. Okay, I've got starting VS code in WSL. And Ubuntu there you go. Is That's what you want. Server. Perfect. Now um, you'll be able to, let me see if I can open up the new window and show you. Let's see, this is a fresh environment. I'll click connect to WSL. And then it says opening remote. And then you can essentially open a folder and then it'll show you in my environment, it just shows me the list of, of folders that I have in, in WSL. Uh huh. Does it show you something similar? Like, uh, so here it shows me this mapping to home instead of C drive. Well, it says you're currently using WSL one. We strongly recommend upgrading to WSL two. Okay, I think you could continue to use one for now and maybe upgrade okay. later. So I'll just erase, uh, delete that. For yeah. A second. But essentially what it'll, it should bring up is the option to load something, load your user folder. Okay, and that's under recent files? Either the recent files or when you say uh, connect to, you know, it, it, it says connect to WSL. And then uh, when you say file open folder, it should show you your WSL folders instead of your C, C drive folders. Okay, got it. So connect to, connect to WSL. Okay, I've got new file, open file, open shoulder, uh, folder. Okay, perfect. So if you're able to go into your, essentially, basically what's happening here is it's Windows maps to your C drive. And then when you create WSL, the equivalent of the C drive is this home folder. So when you enter the WSL environment, it is, it's living somewhere on the C drive, but it's a virtual environment. And, and that's what, what home represents. This tilde, Senna. this is home. Senna. Yeah. Can you show me one more time how to connect? Because I can move, I can go to that folder. Uh -huh. manually when i go uh -huh. file and then open folder and then it doesn't show up but i can just copy and paste i can go there 
but okay. it doesn't look like it's a, they map my Linux folder like a C. Uh, do so you I don't sharing your screen so I sure. can get a better idea? Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. No, not at all. This is this is the reason I'm doing this is because between okay. me giving instructions and sure. and people doing it, there's always there's always something. Yeah, this I, one doesn't show. If I click, uh, see, see, I can go manually like that. Uh huh. If I do, the, does it show this pop up window? Or there you go. It? You are so you are in in software. You have this uh folder, right? Yeah, I can go there, so okay. I can select it, but uh -huh. it doesn't recognize some library, yeah. so it's um, okay. Yeah, that's okay for now because we haven't defined them. Okay. Um, so now what I uh, try clicking on those, you see that little blue box on the bottom left? Yep. Click on that and then connect to WSL. Okay. So now it's starting your your code in Ubuntu. Ah, so good. this Thank now, you. when you go to terminal, you know, if I'm not, let's say I disconnect from WSL or let, let me open up a new window. And okay. in that new window here, I'm not connected to WSL and I open up a, a folder. Stop sharing. Uh, yeah, you can stop sharing now. Um, it's uh, if I open up just any old folder in Windows, uh let's try that one and when i go into terminal this is a different terminal this is a windows environment yeah okay. so this is a windows bash environment now if i uh you know if i close this and if i go into the wsl here i see the linux bash so all your linux commands and things that you see will work here but they won't work in windows and and vice versa and and yeah, you basically here are running a Linux machine. Uh, okay, now I connected to Ubuntu, then okay. seems to recognize the library. Perfect. So do you have Git? I didn't use Git. Okay, uh, I think you can download, see, so see, the, the good thing about Linux is if you don't have something, it tells you how to download it. So if you say Git pull this, copy this URL and you pull that, um, it, it should tell you if you if you don't have Git and how to download it. And if you do have it, it'll simply create this platform workshop folder in your in your software okay. folder. Uh, Sonny, do you want to put that link in the chat? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so what you want to do is get pull this URL. I should type git pull and and I also added some instructions on how to install git if you don't have it. Do I have to sign into GitHub to uh, pull it, or can I? Pull I it? don't think it will require. I'm not sure. Because it's it asking might... me to sign in. Oh boy. Okay. And, and yet I can see your files in GitHub. If you want, you can just copy and paste it, download it. So uh, this just makes it so that you have the repository. But if you don't want to go through the whole rigmarole, uh, you can just download the entire folder. And add it so here. I right click on uh, on step one workspace and copy. Uh, yeah. So here, I think if you do this, you can download the zip. Okay. Wh where was that from? Um, can you see my screen? I can see the... your screen, and I can see Sunsurf. I don't see uh, it, it, I, uh, the the black screen looks like it's in uh, Visual Studio, right? Uh. Well, I think I thought I was sharing the the desktop. Am I not? Uh, I can see clone uh, a window saying local clone in, in the middle, and uh, HTTPS underline. Is that your desktop? 
this is my the the browser window is what I'm sharing right now on my screen. Yeah. Um, so if you go on the browser, yeah. the front page for for GitHub, uh, there's a download zip option as well. Platform workshop download is it in actions. It's in the code. If you go to the green code button. Okay. Oh yes, code. Download zip. Download zip. Uh -huh. Yep. So the advantage of, of having the Git pull is that you then create a Git repository locally. Uh, so I definitely would encourage you to do that at some point, but if you don't, you can just download, simply download the code. And then where do I stick it? Uh, in your software folder. So what I have is here, the, the setup that I have is in my home user folder, I created a software folder and the software folder is what has this platform workshops folder. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, so while you do, I'm gonna continue talking about this Hello World code. Um, and, and so essentially what you see in just about any C++, this is a code is this main function. And the main function is the entry point. Um, and what, it, what these, this means is it's a main function and you can provide it some arguments um, in, in that are integer or, or a string of characters. And you can provide, this is the space that the main function holds for any inputs to the main function. Uh, even though we don't have any for this particular function, we're simply printing out to the screen, hello world, and, and, and then returning the um, uh, control over back to the terminal. Any questions about this piece of code? Okay, so the, the first step is really compi compiling just this main function. And if you just wrote something, you didn't wanna go through all the, the steps of setting up a workspace and then downloading all the other things, you just had G++ and you wanted to compile it, what you would do is, I go back to my readme here, so you can all see where I'm coming up with this. I would just say G++, take this object file um, and create a hello world executable. And I'll use this command to build the code here. Uh, so I would need, because I'm in the software folder, I'll need to add platform workshop so I have the right address. Didn't like it, no such file or directory. So I'm gonna cd into platform workshops, ls to see what's in here. Ah, oh, there we go, we're missing a folder. cd into step one, ls again to see what, what I have. Now I'm in the right folder, I have my source folder. This is my workspace. And so in, in my workspace, I have a source folder. In my source folder, I have hello world. And now to compile hello world, uh, what I'm pressing here on, on my side is control up or uh, just the up function for those who don't have a mini keyboard. You can see that if you do the up function, it shows you uh, the up arrow. It takes you to the, the previous commands that you you had. So you don't have to rewrite all of them. Um, okay, I'm, I'm lost. Okay, well, how can I help? Uh, let, let me go to the uh, Visual Studio screen and okay. then, yeah, uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so get rid of this explorer. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, I've downloaded the zip file. Okay. Okay, so here I am in uh, the Visual Studio. I go file. Um, okay, I don't have the um, the hello world 
thing and it, it looks like it's trying to load github mm, on okay that so that url is is for uh github right okay um, right. what you want to do instead is first extract the zip file okay so the zip file is extracted uh where's my uh folders Okay, so I've got uh, OneDrive software. Yeah. Uh, and then this one was extracted, I thought. Okay, let's extract that and then let's move it to your Ubuntu uh, software folder. Extract, where is extract? I uh, see an extract all. There you go. Okay. And uh, I would recommend renaming it, just take, uh, taking out that main so that the rest of the commands work well for you when you copy paste, yeah. There you go. And now let's see if we can just uh, try right click copy and let's see if we can find your WSL in the VS Code Oops, environment. So it got main on it. Oh, that's okay. All right, let's, yeah, rename it. There you go. Okay, so and right click, copy. copy. Awesome. And then um, let's go back to VS Code. VS Code, okay. Yep. Uh, and then say open folder. Open folder. All right. Uh, yep. Uh, say okay. Now here's where you would create a, a, yes, I trust the authors. This is where you might wanna create a software folder. So uh, go back to the, um, yeah, right, on the, on the uh, left menu, right click and create a software folder. Right click? Uh, yeah, right, right click, new folder, software. Now go into the software folder and paste in your workshop. Uh, do I open it? Yeah. Oh, it looks like it won't open. Let's see if it'll let you paste. Uh, no. No, oh, it looks like it doesn't. Okay, try just creating a new folder then within software and call it. Uh, call it perception workshop and then base the contents in. New folder and then call it what? Uh, let's call it uh, perception. I think what it was called, uh, hold on, platform workshop, Plat platform underscore workshops. Uh, capital W workshops. There you go. And then um, click on that. Let's see if we can reveal it in File Explorer because Visual Studio doesn't seem to be cooperating. Uh, no, in, in Visual Studio, it gives you the option to open in File Explorer. Yeah, when you, oh, click, on, when you click on Platform Workshops. Platform Workshops, uh huh? Yeah, uh, try right clicking, uh, reveal in File Explorer. Oh, uh huh. Ah, uh, yeah. Sometimes I it's frustrating how it. Yeah. Okay. Now you're you're kind of nested, so yeah. If you can un unnest this, and then you have two two platform workshops. If you can copy and paste and and delete the extra. Oh, you've got three. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're in the but you're in the right space. Okay, so, so if I is, cut this and put it in uh, software directly that. under software and delete that yeah so this is where this is i think like this is a great example for for a pretty typical challenge is reconciling the difference between the windows environment and the wsl environment 
but now when you do it a few times, you're able to navigate to it. I'm guessing you'll have to, if you leave that window open, you can find, yeah, there you go. Um, Dong Chul, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure whether this is right. So can I sh show you? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So now I went up to this point. I just copy and paste and then save it as a hello world v2 cpp. Uh, can I see your uh if you can share just uh, the sorry. That's okay. okay. Share only my this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you you're in the Ubuntu environment. Do you have the the folder that um that we were talking about earlier because you only have the hello world file um right. which right. would be for for starters you're probably okay but it doesn't look like you have g g plus plus so the first thing i would do here is sudo apt install g plus okay. plus um, you see how it's telling you when you um when you tried to compile it 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 tells you that you don't have g plus you, you can ex install it okay. um so go ahead and copy and paste that and install g plus plus okay so let me can can you can you tell me how to do it so g plus plus okay g g plus plus uh so if you go back to your terminal where you attempted to run g plus plus ubuntu gave you a, a set of errors and within that, at the end of that set of errors, it gives you a solution. It says to install G++, use sudo apt install G++. Um, should, should I hear, do it here? Under, yeah, if you okay. go up, you can copy the command. You see that sudo apt install G++? Sudo apt G++. No, uh, sudo apt. App, yes, sudo app. Uh, T for telephone. I, I put it in the chat as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's a good idea. So yeah. How, it, how can I put, okay, chat. So you see where above that history APT. restored, uh, do you see that, that what in the terminal, it shows you which command to type. It says, um, I, I'm not sure how to point to your screen. Uh, let me see. Give oh, it's me. working. Oh, there you go. There you ins you're installing it now. Okay. Uh, but what I was po trying to point out too is that when you try to run something in in the Linux environment that you don't have, um, if you look at the errors, it usually tells you how to get it. It usually tells you, oh, you don't have G++. Here's the command that you use to install G++. And so uh, typically, I don't even worry about whether I have something. I just try to use it. And then, oh, looks like you, there were some security issues. Oh, there you go. See, this is it. Uh, now, it's telling you at the end that last error. It yeah. says, run apt get update. Right. So now if you run app get update, it'll what what happens is sometimes with these libraries, it needs you to have uh, go ahead. Don't, don't don't type the command. Just type apt get update. Yes, yep. Get yep. Update. There you, there you go. go. Yeah. So now and it's gonna want sudo. Sorry? It's gonna want sudo in front of that. Yeah, try sudo. There you go. So sometimes it needs you to have um, the packages already downloaded. And then it, when you when you run install, it unpacks the, the, the downloaded packages and then installs it on your environment. Uh, so that's what it's doing right now. OK. Uh, so if you go click the up arrow, it should directly take you to the previous commands you ran. Okay. Um, go back one more. One more. One more. 
There you go. Sudo apt install G++. Yep. This one. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yes, the capital Y, yeah. Or little Y should work too. So now you're now you should be good to go with, with G. And now if you run go up a few and run the G oh hello world, uh type the up arrow again a few times and you'll get to it. Okay, so G plus plus I I didn't uh here that. I'll put it in the chat again. It's okay. Hello world and then SRC slash hello. Yep. Hello. CPP. Yep. So what this is saying is make an executable called hello world out of this C++ code and enter. And it doesn't like it because that's C, that's CD to the correct. Uh, yeah, you need us. There you go. Yep. Now, uh, you, do you see the executable? Is this one? Yep. That's it. So to run that, do a dot and forward slash hello world. That is Linux speak for run this executable. And there you have it. Okay, thank you. Nice. Yeah, for sure. See, that's the that's the hardest part. <laughs> it okay. just but, gets easier yeah. for you. But still yeah. it's showing something it's not recognized. Is it we'll get to that. We'll get okay. to that next. All right. Okay. Um, I, I don't have that uh, software WSL Ubuntu. Uh, okay. Uh, can uh, I let share me my show screen you. again? Yeah, please do. I'll show you how to get to it. Okay, so I've got okay. WS open to here. Okay, now open folder. Open folder. Uh, either there or yeah, either way. And then go to software. Platform workshops. That okay is fine, I think. Or step one workshop workspace. Let's let's go into that. Yeah. Oh. Ah. There you go. So if you go into step one workspace. Now go into a uh, terminal. This one? Yep. And new terminal. Awesome. So now you're in the terminal for platform workshops. And now you, if you do LS, enter, you'll see all the contents inside the terminal. Uh, so I would just CD to step one workshop to so CD step one workshop works workspace. And you don't have to type the whole thing. If you do tab, it'll autocomplete for you. Ah. There you go. Yeah, that tab complete is a dream. So it's also a great way to avoid errors. So now you can you can type that G plus plus command in here. Uh, it's in chat if you want to copy and paste it. I'm wondering how I get the chat with uh, what I'm sharing. There we go. This one here? Oh, install G, uh, sudo app G++. Uh, you don't need to. Just try running it because you might already have G++. This so one if here? You say, uh, yeah, if you say G++ dash O hello world. Um, source slash hello world dot cpp yeah and i think you have two g's but there you go go uh, do an up arrow and and just delete one g just down arrow again yeah oops cpp i gotta get to the beginning there that's okay. If you do, uh, I don't think the point, the mouse works. Yeah, but if you use an arrow, you could. There you go. And then forward and add a P. Awesome. Oh, looks like, yeah. So now you got to install G++. So sudo apt install G++. So control C? Yep. Oops, control C and copy pasta. And then just tab, huh? Uh, just paste, yeah. Is there, there an extra space there? I think you could type enter. Oh. oh do you need a, the password? I will go look for it. Thank you very much. Okay, for sure. 
you could at this point if you don't have your ubuntu password you could probably do most of these steps in your without using wsl but then you'll be diverging quite a bit from the rest um in you could try it in powershell too Uh, Aha. Go ahead. I have you. my password here. Now I just you got do? a copy. Nice. Awesome. Oops. Why did it go? So while, while you do, I'm going to um, hit on some of the, the questions that you were talking about. Uh, uh, don't you, you, you know, when you shared your screen earlier, you noticed that you had all these squiggle lines on IO stream, but for some reason you were still able to compile the code, right? Yeah. Um, so the, yeah. the, the, the code still compiled because all the libraries that you needed, G++ had this IO stream library already. And, and, you know, that, that wasn't an issue. G++ was able to use it and compile your code, but the squiggles essentially come from IntelliSense and it's your IntelliSense is this little guy here, the language mode. Um, and it tells it's defined, its configurations are defined in these .vs code files. So if you haven't already, I would would recommend to take the, you know, either download the zip files or do a git pull and get all the other files in as well. Um, because IntelliSense is what is defined in the C CPP properties. Here, uh, I can tell it, oh, uh, you know, this is the configuration for the Linux environment. These are the folders you want to use. So use the workspace folder. Later, we'll be using the Eigen library. So I've specified that as well. Uh, I specify the IntelliSense mode and the compiler path. So once it knows where the compiler is, once it knows where the, the files are, uh, it's able to I, recognize this IO stream because it knows where the, where the uh, G++ is and it knows where the different dependencies are. So you said IntelliSense that make that folder and files? Mm -hmm. IntelliSense needs to know where your G++ okay. compiler is. IntelliSense needs to know where the dependencies are. Yeah. And, and this is where um, the IntelliSense definitions live. How, how can I get that one? So the right click on the bottom, so you just show me, but it's, let me, sorry. Uh, so if you want, you can download the... Yeah. So once I click it... Yeah. yeah. Should I do something here? Uh, you could you could do that. I'd say try it. Um, if you want to take a shortcut, you can simply download the entire folder that I that ah. I put on GitHub. Because okay. all these configurations essentially live in this .vs code. Everything that VS Code needs is defined in these files. And these are only some of the configurations. VS Code, depending on the extension you use, has all kinds of configurations. And, and I'll describe some of the configurations that are commonly utilized um, to help developers. The IntelliSense is extremely helpful because it essentially looks up all the libraries, tells you what the different classes and functions are when you start typing. Uh, and, and the configurations for IntelliSense, so Visual Studio knows where to find the different libraries, where to find the compiler. All those definitions are in this CCPP properties. Oh, okay, okay. So I download it and then unzip it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you have git I recommend doing a git pull um, mm. but if you don't then then maybe just download it and copy paste it into your software folder okay so I today I just copy and paste okay yeah so home mine software or under software to change the pull the name and then move it here okay 
So under this platform under bar workshop, I have to move the hello world underneath. Uh, yeah, so maybe try and like leave the one that you have uh, separate and maybe just try to enter the, the new folder that you downloaded. Okay, make another one. Yeah, okay. yeah. That way you can tinker on your own later to see if you wanna recreate the process. Okay. Okay, so it is not letting me enter my password. Uh, uh oh, what is does it say? It, it's just saying pseudo password for UX bend and uh, is uh, just not letting me enter there. Hmm. Let's see, what is it? Uh, does it just not like your password or? So this, this here, this, uh -huh. I, I should be able to type in there, right? Yeah, I think it's because you're installing something. Oh, but I wasn't a while back. Uh, oh, just, okay. Uh, um, sometimes, so so what I find a little bit disorienting with with Linux too. So if I if I type something in uh you know in Windows, it shows me. But when you're typing a password, it doesn't move the cursor. Oh. Yeah, I found this uh, really strange when I first said it doesn't move the cursor. So you really don't know how many characters you've typed. You don't, it's very disorienting. It's just one of those things. So if I've been typing away in there, do I yeah, have Yeah, it just doesn't, yeah. I didn't know that at first. Delete, 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 and then type it real carefully. Uh, what I try to do too is just type it in text and then copy and paste it because that way I know, that way I know what it's doing. Okay, but, so I, I uh, copied it from my uh, uh, my Excel. It, could I yeah. just do a control V? Yeah. And then enter? Enter. Oh no, it says <laughs> right. It's a, it's a, it probably just has some extra cursor. Yeah, just try it again. If it's, it's just fine. try it again without like, yeah, control V, make sure you don't have any white space. Try okay. typing it really slowly. Are you sure you have the right password too? Uh, it's the one that I had there, yes. Okay. Ubuntu 224043. Okay, I guess I got it uh, to, to create a different um, Ubuntu, right? Well, I'm, I'm hoping we won't have to get to that. Uh, I've, I've got PowerShell open if I, if I can do that. That might be much more involved. Oh, but then it's also looking for Eurek Bind here too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's. I think. I think maybe try. Let me see if I. I don't know how else I might be able to recreate this. Um, because what, hap what happens if you just hit enter with a yeah. password prompt with 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 not with? I've known that to work. I've known I've, that to work in certain instances. There, you right. got three attempts. Just try it once, once again, um, and and see if you can't like. I'm trying to see what happens when I press copy paste on my end. Yeah, I, I suspect it might be the copy paste might be doing something. something yeah, usually weird. for Linux, if you just right click, it pastes something in, so you don't need a Control V. You just when you right click. It, it, um, yeah, see, it does that, right? So when you try running sudo apt install G++ and then just don't press anything else, just right click when it gives you the password prompt and, and press enter. It installed oh, oh, up arrow. Up yeah. arrow. Up arrow? Yeah, I would just do up arrow. Yeah. Oh, too many, I think we. Go back down arrow. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. There you go. Uh, no, go back up. I thought maybe just type sudo aptens. There you go. All right. Voila. And now just right click and press enter. Oh no, hmm. it doesn't like it. Hmm. That's, I mean, I, I'm wondering if you just have the wrong password.
Want to see? I, I will look for. I, I will look in other okay. places and see if I've got some other entry. Okay. Uh, the other thing we can do is maybe just go out of WSL and and try using the Windows PowerShell. So even in the VS Code environment, if you go to that, you see that uh, WSL Ubuntu blue box in VS Code. Yeah, click on that, and then it's. It, I think you can just uh, disconnect from WSL. Or this you reopen, reopen folder in Windows. Uh, you can allow it. Now when you go to terminal, um, so if you go, um, if you go into the, the three little dots next to view, and you should be able to see terminal of one up. Yeah, there you go. Terminal, new terminal. This brings up the PowerShell and see if you can type G++, the same command. Not sure if it works for Windows the same way, but it's worth a shot. Oops, I put it way in there. Oops. Just enter and, and try and try it again. It won't do anything. Enter? Yeah. Now try pasting it again. Or, or uh no, try uh try compiling the hello world code. So essentially um do C D into the step one workspace. So CD step one workspace. You can try the tab complete. Amazing. Yep. And now, um, now you can try the G plus plus dash O source hello world. There you go. Um, actually, you'll need a. G++ is not recognized, maybe GDB will work. So if you want, you can Google, um, I think for Windows, GDB might work instead of G++. So Google? Yeah, try try Googling what the Windows command is for, for, for that. And then uh, while you do, you know, I'll, I'll go through the rest of the launch files and then check in again with you. Uh, I uh, I don't have a way of testing this, but I did put a possible uh, way of eventually getting the password reset. Oh, uh, nice. In WSL. Ah. So, um, Let's let's uh, let me get back here on the the other side on the uh, while while you require, let me I'll check in with you in another five or ten minutes while I go through some of this other stuff. Um, let's see. We were talking about the configurations. I'm going to talk about the configurations first and then come back to linking a new library. So I described um, the CPP properties. That is that's where the IntelliSense descriptions are. The other configurations you see here are launch.json and app.json. So see how you, you know, right now we're, we're typing into the command prompt all these G++ something or the other, right? What task.json does is it takes these commands that we put in, uh, in the command prompt and it defines it in this configuration file. So here you can see the, um, the type of the task that you're using is to build the CPP file. So it's CPP build type task. 
you can assign a label to it so that you can find this task easily and you can reference it in other configurations. So this is just your, your label for it. And, and so here you can say for the, for the task I'm defining, this is the name, this is the command is G++, right? But G++ lives inside this user bin folder. So you wanna make sure that that your command um, has the, the uh, folders that the executables folders are also defined. And then these are the arguments for the command. So the arguments we used were pretty straightforward. We just used dash O and we used the file name um, and that's it, right? But, and we used the, but there's a few more here that are added. So this dash F diagnostics color says that, oh, print out all the, all the errors in a nice colored format that you can easily discern thing, one thing from another. So errors are in red and, and, you know, it just gives you a nice format on the output. Um, I, this dash G tells you uh, which file you want the executable to be. Um, actually, this is the dash O tells you what the file, the executable is, and dash G tells you which file you want to compile. So if you're running in, in VS Code, if I'm running this, if I go to this run arrow, it compiles the file that I'm running, right? Uh, instead of file, giving the name of the file, your, your task is just showing you, telling you that run, compile whatever file I'm in. And then create the, ex the executable in my workspace folder. So remember, this is your workspace. Create the executable in the workspace. And then we haven't come to this, but if you have any dependencies that you need to include, it's the dash I. So essentially, instead of typing out the, the G++ and all the related things in here, um, you, you're, you're putting all the arguments in this configuration file. Um, and you're describing the, the configuration in this task folder, uh, in this task.json. Any questions about task.json? All right, so last, last configuration that we have here is launch.json. So CPP properties is, is telling IntelliSense where things are, task.json, it defines all the um, all the things, the compile process, the compile commands that we want so that instead of going in and typing all these lengthy commands, we can simply go to run. And then um, when you say run, we say run without debugging it. Oh, debug anyway. Looks like it didn't like something I was doing. Open launch.json. Let's see. Let's see what happened here. Uh, let's see. So, okay, let's try this again. Uh, go back to terminal. Anytime you, you run into an issue, remember control C is your friend, or control Z, or even just enter, right? Linux is good about telling you what to do. So, Try all the different things and get back into command. And then here, I'm gonna try and click on the run arrow again to see if my tasks run. Okay, that time it ran. Not sure what happened, but remember how before I had to say G++ something? Because I have this task.json defined, I can simply go into hello world and click on this play button and it simply runs the code and here it compiles this hello world. So if I go back into the terminal, I can see that it compiled it and then it also ran it because I can see this hello world output here. Um, any questions about this task.json and C CPP properties? All right, so the the last thing here, the you know, well, very seldom is it that that you compile it and everything's rosy uh, and and you're happy with stuff. Usually, you you have bugs, 
And if the program isn't working quite like you want it to, um, you'll have to debug it. And one way to debug it is to add a breakpoint. So, you know, anytime you you click, go into any any line on um, in the Visual Studio Code Editor, it, it gives you the option to add a breakpoint. So here, if I have a bug in this code and I want to debug it, you can add a breakpoint here. So what happens when I run this and in debug mode is it uses the configurations defined in the launch.json to debug my code. Um, so task tells you tells VS Code how to compile the code and then launch tells it how to debug it. Uh, so what's in launch.json? The first thing that, that launch.json defines is this pre-launch task. It's the same as the label for my task.json. Um, so in launch.json, we know before you launch, run the run the compile task, build the code. And then these are the parameters that are defined to help C++ um, is to help you debug the code within this environment. So it says use this is the debug deep CPP debug is the type of configuration you're defining. Uh, this is the program that you're debugging. Remember your when you're running hello world, uh, you're and you're outputting this um, executable to your workspace. This is the executable you're debugging. Now I don't have any arguments for this executable, so this can be blank. But if you were say adding two numbers, the arguments here would be the two numbers. Um, so you can define all of these parameters in the launch file. That that the sequence here is is in, what happens is. IntelliSense helps you write the code. So CPP properties helps you write the code. Task.json helps you build it. And then launch.json helps you debug it. Does that sound, how does that sound? Any, any questions about that? Sounds good. All right, how are you doing, Yurik, now that we're done with the <laughs> Well, I've got so, the Ask Ubuntu, and I, I think I'll just work this uh, in, in the background here. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, so now, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, oh, Dom Joe, go ahead. Yeah, it, it seems to recognize that because I download everything in that Git uh, folder. So now it recognized, but whenever, it, just like we did, when I run CPP file, mm -hmm. Complain something about JSON. Something Let's like take a that. look. Do you mind sharing yeah. your screen? Sure. So here, now mm -hmm. it seems to have a, everything I need. Perfect. And, then, and recognize this library. Nice. Yeah. So then here, when I run, uh -huh. right? Then it give me some option. To yeah, click the first one. First one? Yeah. Right? What that's doing is it's it's clicking the G plus plus config. Okay, okay, so it says debug path is invalid. That's fine. Uh, you did create a hello world. Okay, open launch JSON. Uh, so interestingly enough, it doesn't like something in your debug path. I wonder if it's because you didn't have a breakpoint defined. I'm not sure. See if we if we just run it. Um, Try clicking and uh, just enter or something so you get back to terminal. Let's test out. Before we test out the debug, let's see if it's uh, building the code correctly. So delete your hello world executable. Uh, um, yep, that's one? the one. Yeah, delete it. Okay, now go to run. Go to. Or even just open up hello world.cpp. Okay. And hit the play button, just click it. No need to, yeah, okay. yeah, run it. Uh, yep. Okay, so it did create the hello world, but it didn't like the debug part. Okay, so you know your task.json is working fine. It's your launch.json that seems to have an issue. 
Um, so again, these are very environment specific things, right? Uh, what might work on my end might not work on yours. So no. then this is where we have to figure out what's going on. So press any key to close the terminal, get back to the terminal, enter, yeah. Uh, so MI mode is what it seems to be having an issue with. It could be that I have GDB and oh yeah, I see why it, uh, Try G plus plus there, yeah. Do G plus plus in launch.json. I this is my bad. I should fix it. Um, because so I, I G plus plus. Should I? Yeah, yeah. G plus okay. plus. I'm using in my launch file. I was using GDB, which is a different kind of compiler. Uh, but you don't have GDB. You have G plus plus. So and it's consistent with how you're compiling the code. So, so should you, I change everything like a G plus plus? Yeah. Right here but the, the description is yeah. It's a comment, but it's good to change. So try that. Okay, and then uh, I save it. Yep. And the one. Run. 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 Run and debug. Oh, missing or has invalid value. Okay. Uh, did we save the launch? Yeah, looks like we did. Okay. okay. Um, let's see, debugger path is correct. Uh, let's try putting a breakpoint and and see in hello world.cpp. Maybe here. Yep. Uh, yeah. now let's try debug. Yeah. And G plus plus. That's uh, yep. That's the one. No, it still has an issue. Uh, MI mode is missing or right, has... attributes, MI mode. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay. Uh, okay. Let me see what this might be. We'll have to Google and, and find out. So MI mode for G++. Another, um, so this is another one that I linked in, uh, in the references is how to get this micro C++ set up for Linux. Um, this is a really good, this is the tutorial that I followed. Um, okay. And so this is, you know, this is much more detailed than, than what we covered. And if you say, where is G++, maybe it'll tell you. Uh, the other thing you can do is is just install GDB. So if you do this sudo app get install build essentials GDB, oh yeah, that's why. Go ahead. Well, I, I, we're thinking the same thing. I just put that in the chat. Yeah, install GDB because that's what you need to debug. I think G, G++ only helps you compile, but you do need GDB to debug. Um, and so I, I think if you install GDB and go back to the launch file that the way that it was, this should work. Okay, now I'm installing GDB. Mm -hmm. And then going back to GDB. Yep. And then 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 try it with, with it uh with the launch configs at, as GDB. So I'm gonna change mine to okay. Yep. So installing it's done. Now I'm doing uh debug. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't complain. Then it stopped at the, the red. Does, did it work? Yeah, so let me share. Yeah, so this one. Nice. Yeah. Sweet. Stopped. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, how are, how's the rest of the Linda's guy? Do you, do you feel like you're following to, to the extent that you need for this class or do you have any burning questions that I can address um, before I move on to the next topic? All right. So this is uh, straightforward enough, right? Um, getting to just one, uh, you know, standard library that's already in G++ and then printing something out. 
the next usually you'll be using other open source libraries or you'll be using uh your own libraries even and and so what what we would want to do then is to um is to find a way to include those right so i haven't mentioned it in in the because we already defined it in these uh, config parameters and go back to my read me so I can follow along. Um, we've already described this. So if you if you want, you can try it using the command prompt. Uh, when you go to that eigen add.cpp, this, this is the command that you would use. But first you need to download eigen.git. So if you have git, um, if you don't have git, I think now's the right time to install it because I think it's a, one of the most critical tools uh, you'll use in not just in in controlling the version of your own code, but also in using other libraries. Uh, so it's it's well worth your time to install Git, um, and then once you do, you can download this eigen.git. Um, which is, Eigen is a library that's very widely used in robotics for linear algebra. It has a lot of optimized code for matrix manipulation, numerical solvers, a lot of different things that use Eigen. Uh, so it's a very useful library. Uh, but here I'm, I'm just illustrating the point that um, Given this, that this is using an external library, now I don't even see this library in here, right? It's not in my workspace. Where is this library? The, the location of this library is in software. This is where I pulled the library, but it's outside of my workspace. So I have to describe, define it as a dependency um, using this dash I and describe the location of this. Now here I'm doing something that's, that's kind of frowned upon for good reason. I'm defining a path that is uh, absolute instead of relative to my workspace. Uh, but what you want to do is maybe define a path that that's relative to your workspace or, or relative to your environment. Um, but if you use this dash I um, uh, option, you can define the, the location of any dependent libraries you have. And then here's my eigen library. This is where um, I did a git pull of that eigen um, address that I shared and then pulled a bunch of the, the files. Uh, so this downloads the eigen library. And now when I, because I have this defined in the tasks, if I go to eigen add and I play, hit play here, it starts to build the, um, this eigen add function. And what the eigen add function does is it, it creates a two by two matrix. It, it assigns some values to elements in that matrix. And then it adds two of those elements uh, for the last value. And then it prints out the entire matrix. So let's see if that worked. Uh, it did create this eigen add executable here. And then I say ls, let's see if that's available. Yep, it is. And I say dot slash eigen add and run and voila, it outputs a matrix. So now what this demonstrates is that if that my if I have these uh, dependent library defined in my task.json, I'm able to, um, to build code that uses a dependent library. And similarly for debugging, remember task.launch.json calls that task.json. So if I were to debug this code too, um, I can set a breakpoint and then it should stop at this. And then I can see, you know, I can see here, this is IntelliSense and debugger working together. You can see this eigen plane object base, eigen matrix, all the definitions of this M that I'm working with, right? Uh, you can see really what's in the memory, what class it is, what, what, what the details are of this parameter that you're using. All the data, um, all the values, all of this is, is useful information for the debugger. So I'm going to control C out of there, go back to the workspace. Any questions about compiling with the dependent library? Yeah. 
Okay, so the, is that the absolute directory? Is that how you define the software icon? Yeah, what I did was if you go back to the readme, uh, in the software folder, I downloaded the eigen library by saying git clone, uh, yep. git, yep, this live eigen. Okay. So, uh, under software, okay. Yep, yep. Under software. Okay, so then let's task. Jackson has the software slash eigen. Okay, mm -hmm. and then my eigen at the CPP is supposed to recognize that one automatically? Uh, yeah, what it does is it uh, initializes a matrix with some values. So, if, but do you have the eigen uh, library in your software? I, first, I downloaded the wrong place, but I move everything under software eigen. Okay. Yeah, just like yep. that. Yep. Yeah, so, so if you have eigen in software, then yep. you can go back to your workspace, um, go back to eigen add, and then click play again. Okay, play as a run. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it seems it's working, but still I see some the line red line underneath eigen tense. Oh, I wonder. Uh, do you mind sharing your screen? Sure. Okay. All right, so doesn't like that. Um, interesting. That's, that's this. Yeah, I think it might be because the in CPP properties .json, do you have this software eigen? Okay. So let me. Uh, see if you can put this extra dots there. Um, you see what I'm sure. What this shows these two extra oh. aspects. Proceeds, it essentially tells the IntelliSense to look at all the fo files within that folder. I see. So this structure, it is software? Yep, your structure is correct. Okay. So uh, if you go into, yeah, your structure is correct. If you go into what I noticed in CPP properties is that yeah. you had software icon, but you didn't have this forward slash and double asterisks. Um, and that Essentially, yeah. If you have those, then then maybe it recognizes it. Now go back and see. I can add. Oh, it still doesn't. Um, click on that that light bulb too. See what it says. Okay, it edit include path settings. Uh, yeah. Here you might be able to say what the include path is. Uh, let me see what my include path settings are. So this is again going into the nitty gritty of of Visual Studio configurations. I go into uh, let's see, yeah. To find where the settings are. Sometimes you can say Control Shift D, and then yeah, C so C plus plus. Well, this is not what I was looking for. But um, maybe I can help with that offline. Uh, okay. Um, but essentially what it, you know, depend, depending on where your include paths are and things are, uh, IntelliSense recognizes it too. But in this case, it seems like you're able to build because tasks has this knowledge, but somehow IntelliSense doesn't. So it's, a, it's, it's trying to figure out the IntelliSense extension properties there that'll get you all the way there to recognizing these as well. Um, so I know we only have five minutes, so I'm not going to dwell too much on um, the CMake list, but I'm going to round it out just by saying like this last step now, let's, you what you've done so far is you've got a Hello World program, you've used the 
um, command prompt to, to run and compile it. You've defined uh, the configuration files so that you can run, you can compile any code by just clicking the play arrow in VS Code. And you've also defined configuration so that you can use def de dependent libraries. Now, all this is fine for the Visual Studio Code environment, but when you're building and shipping code and sharing it with other people, um, it, you know, they might be using a different environment. They might be using a different uh, compiler. You, you want to make sure they use the same compiler, uh, regardless of what environment that they, what, what IDE they use. So taking these things that we specify for the VS Code IDE and moving it into something that is more universal, and that's where CMake comes in. Uh, so CMake is a very widely used um a tool for package uh, building and what it tells you is is um, you know first you start with which which version of CMake are you using you describe your project name so in this case I should probably change it to hello world and then um, you describe the the standard that you're using so you're using C++ 17 in this case C++ comes up with updates uh, so this describes the standards you're using. Um, these are all the different settings that you can define for the C++ um, compiling. So this tells you, you know, it'll give you warnings in case you build something wrong, uh, in case your code doesn't meet a certain standard. Uh, some other options you can add are uh, ways so that it gives you more detailed verbose descriptions. Uh, it has warnings that are that are uh, also listed when you build the code. And then you can add any executables that you want to generate. So if you have a project that has multiple executables, you can define them all here in the CMake list. So CMake list tells people who are using your workspace how to use your workspace. It, it builds things, it describes the dis dependent directories, it describes the different standards. Um, and there's a lot of different templates for CMake, li CMake lists out there. Uh, I try to pick very few options, but you, you one, one of the things that I do, and this again, it's not, I haven't listed it on the readme, but uh, I'll probably add it because it's so useful. Um, highly recommend getting uh, GitHub Copilot, because what I can say here, if I if I have GitHub Copilot running and you see these two stars here, I can just say slash explain. And, and then GitHub Copilot, and then if I click play, GitHub Copilot will explain everything in the CMake list. So this is a great way to learn uh, and to write. And, and you can even say at VS Code. So if you don't want to look up the documentation, you can at VS Code and ask it something. You can say, what is CMake list? And it, it tells you, looks up VS Code documentation and tells you. So these are just some of the tools. Um, if so you if you've got Copilot installed, that will automatically um, in, uh, engage it? Uh, if you if you have Copilot installed, yes, um, I do. yeah, do you do you see this little alien face in the uh, in your um, options? Where are you pointing? Uh, in the on the bottom right. Oh yes, uh huh. Let me see. So if you click on that, you can go to GitHub Copilot chat. And then, and then ask it questions. But also, if you if you click on any line within uh, this, right? If you double click on any spot in the in in the text, it gives you these little stars that you can you can ask. But I I generally just like going to the chat. I don't like this terminal very much. I just go to the chat and then I ask a question. So I can say forward slash explain and then ask it a more verbose question about something in my workspace. So this is a great way to get up and running when you're in a new environment. Let's say I don't know what the different options available are, or I copied and pasted a CMake list file from somewhere, but I want to know what I'm doing. I can say slash explain and then modify as needed. 
Uh, so this is where I think the, the using the GitHub Copilot makes it much faster to operate in a new environment and learn something new. Fantastic. All right. So um, that's the, I'm going to leave the, given that we're at time, I'm going to leave this last exercise to you to build the code using CMake. Um, and if you have any questions at all, just write to me. I think you can just reach out to me on GitHub and then I'd be happy to help you out in, in getting set up. Really appreciate this. This is fantastic. Absolutely. Happy to help. Um, any That's questions, good. any parting remarks, any requests for the next one uh, besides the unit desk? I, I see at least one thank you in the chat, and I want to say thank you as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank this you. was fun. Hey, this thanks, was really for, good. thanks for hanging out, and thanks for uh, puzzling through these different environment things uh, with me. I think this is very much a learn by doing uh, type of uh, exercise. I hope uh, you were all able to draw something from it. Did you great? I know I was. Thank you all. All right. Th thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Bye.